this human stuff is species chauvinism basically and it's leading gonna lead to disaster okay and that we've got to pull back and we can't so strongly identify with the human and of course the other part of the bipolar is saying we're too restrained right we need to go further right look at how much we've been able to do you know in the history of science and technology over the past 200 years carry on guys and 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 if we and if we trash the planet there's always mars Hello, everyone. My name is Stephen Parton, and you're listening to the Feedback Loop on Singularity Radio, where we keep you up to date on the latest technological trends and how they're impacting the transformation of consciousness and culture. This week, our guest is sociologist Steve Fuller, who has a long history exploring transhumanism, starting predominantly with his 2011 book, Humanity 2.0, What It Means to Be Human, Past, Present, and Future. To start this conversation, we first ask the question, what is Human 1.0? What is the version of humanity that we've had since the dawn of civilization? And then from there, we take a journey into the details of the transformation that we're currently undergoing into Humanity 2.0, into the different flavors of post-humanism and the different challenges and opportunities that each afford. This means a deep exploration of the sociopolitical, the cultural, the moral, and the religious changes that the future has in store for us. Steve's enthusiasm and knowledge make for a really exciting and educational conversation that I truly think you'll enjoy. So without further ado, let's just go ahead and jump into it. Everyone, please welcome to the Feedback Loop, Steve Fuller. Well, to start then, man, let's just talk about the fact that in, in one interview, I believe I saw you say something to the effect of you don't believe that we were humans before we were living in civilizations. And I think that's an interesting place to maybe start before we really explore the ideas of human 2.0. So can can you talk a little bit about what you meant by that? Okay. Okay. I uh, actually draw a distinction between being human and being homo sapiens. Let's Mm. put it that way. Okay. And so in this regard, uh, being human is something that homo sapiens had to learn to do. Right, and so that then relates to what you heard in, in, in some interview I gave about civilization being necessary. I mean, I don't know if civilization is, it's a bit heavy as a word, uh, but I do think there's a sense in which um, being human, see, this is very important, I think, with regard to where we go in the future, because it's a contingent fact of evolutionary biology that humanity came from Homo sapiens. Okay, it's a contingent fact. That is to say, um, there's no particular reason why in advance it had to happen, but it did happen. Um, And then the question for us, as the the people who self-identify as humans, is to where do we go from here? And I actually take it to be a kind of open question, um, the extent to which Homo sapiens has to remain the exclusive platform on which humanity carries forward. And this then gets us to humanity 2.0 and what that might mean. Okay. So, so that's my starting point. So it sounds like you're saying there's a distinction between what humanity is, as like an abstract concept that we define ourselves as maybe our values, behaviors, etc., and the homo sapien as a biological uh, vehicle. Is that, is that that's correct? Yes, that's, that's correct. Um, and, um, you know, if you wanted to go into the history, I mean, there is a history to how the human arose as this concept that then becomes kind of self-defining for Homo sapiens. And that's an interesting story in its own right, because I would argue that it was only in the mid 18th century that the seal was, de- you know, the deal was sealed, right? Insofar as Homo sapiens equals human got established. Before that time, human was still a kind of floating signifier that could apply to a lot of different things and perhaps not even to all of Homo sapiens, right? But in the mid 18th century, right? uh, Which is the period when we start to talk about things like democracy and equality and, right? And these things start to become politically uh, tractable um, that then the equation, right? That all Homo sapiens are equal, right? uh, As humans, right? They're all equally human. 
that kind of gets sealed at that point in the mid 18th century. But before that time, there's a real open question about it. And that's why all the people, you know, if you look in the history of politics, all the people who are campaigning against slavery and all these other things that we would now see as subjugating human beings, there was always kind of a mixed reception to that kind of stuff until the mid 18th century, because I think then you start to get this very modern notion that all homo sapiens are human. And that in a sense, it's an exclusive category to homo sapiens. So then that establishes what you would call humans 1.0, right? Which is something that's right. That's, that's more right. Egalitarian, more uh, yeah, it's, modern, it's, liberal. It's the human, it's the humanity of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights from the United Nations in 1948. It's that human. That's the one they're talking about. Is that human? And that human in 1948 had only really been on the map for about 200 years. And my point is with transhumanism and also with posthumanism, the questions opened up again. Mm. So what does that look like then, the difference between 1.0 and 2.0, uh, what transhumanists or posthumanists are fighting for? What's, what's the gap between these two worlds? Okay. Well, I think the issue here uh, is that um, you might say that humanity has become somewhat conceptually unsustainable. I think that might be the way to put it. Um, and what I mean by that is that um, because of all of, you know, if you think about the history of politics, right, in the modern period that has been done in the name of humanity, right, um, a lot of it has just not succeeded. It hasn't lived up to its own hype, right? And as you know, there's enormous amounts of critiques that are out there, especially in the academic culture, right, which critique everything from ideas of freedom to democracy to equality, right, basically saying these things are, uh, have not been realized and are in some sense maybe even unrealizable, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and so all of that stuff actually does put uh, the normative standard of humanity under question, right? Um, so for example, if you look at the UN Declaration of Human Rights, you know, and you're looking at it now from the standpoint of, uh, you know, 2021, um, and that is like 75 years or whatever since it was written, you notice stuff like no animals, there are no animals in the UN Declaration of Human Rights, okay? Certainly no machines, right? And, and, you know, in terms of artificial intelligence or anything like that. Um, and of course those, you know, just to conjure up two kinds of entities for a moment, right? Um, they have become increasingly salient, right? Um, you know, not only in the sense that, that people are becoming more aware of them, but that people in, in, are increasingly defining their own sense of meaning in the world in relation to them, mm. right? So, so let me, you know, if we say post-humanism, for example, right? And, and there's a lot of ways of conceptualizing it, but I think one way that is actually quite concrete, right, uh, is actually in terms of uh, the way in which more radical environmentalists talk, uh, who, who basically say that the human is just one among many animal species and you know, if we're gonna survive, we're gonna to survive together. We're not gonna survive by humans somehow dominating everything because that's in fact the source of our problems, right? Our climate change problems and everything else. In other words, the more that the human animal has pulled away from the rest of the animal world, the more these environmental problems start to come to the fore as they have you know, since the industrial revolution basically, right? And post-humanism is very sensitive to this and so, what makes posthumanism post is the idea that it decenters the human as the locus of value and moves to a kind of much more generic category, which you might call life, right? Life itself, right? So it's something like biodiversity, right? Where the idea is you want to preserve as many species as possible, and you consider that kind of an, uh, you know, a kind of value goal, right, for your, for your world, right? right? That's posthumanist, right? Because it, does, it doesn't center on the human. So that's one way. Now, then we've got these transhumanists uh, and, and with, with which I have typically identified, um, though I'm, uh, I'm seen as somewhat critical of them, but I suppose in this discussion, I'm on the transhumanist side. And this is basically, let me put, I'm gonna put it in, in, in less um, uh, flattering terms than I think transhumanists would talk about it because I think this is only fair to talk about what this stuff looks like in its naked form, right? It's basically saying we haven't become human enough. Hmm. Right. In other words, what it's about is actually exaggerating the difference, right, between what the human is and the animal origins of Homo sapiens. Right. And you can think about that happening in many different ways. And, and transhumanism in that respect is a very broad church. 
right? So you got the people who want us to be able to extend our lives in our biological bodies indefinitely, right? Be able to regenerate cells and all this, re-engineer the genes to enable all that to happen. So we basically become perpetual motion machines, right? We never die, right? That's kind of an, one ambition that stays within Homo sapiens, but it basically defies kind of what has been the defining feature of all other life forms on the planet, which is mortality, right? So, so, so that is one way in which you could think about the human pulling away from the animal. But of course, there are more radical ways of doing it, right? Of course, uh, you might say an intermediate step along the way is the cyborg existence, where in some sense, the, you know, technology is implanted into us or in some sense becomes you know, uh, 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 like at least a wearable, like Neuralink, right? I mean, you know, something that in a sense becomes very much part of defining who we are, right? Uh, and in a sense, we can't really fully be who we are unless we've got this technology around. And in a sense, even the kind of physically distributed forms of technology, like smartphones and things like that, already kind of count as this, right? They count toward the cyborganization of the human, because if you get rid of the person's smartphone, effectively half their brain is gone, right? Even though it was implanted in this physically distinct machine, right? So there's a cyborg thing. Um, but of course, the most radical one is the idea of mind uploading, right? Where in some sense, right, the defining characteristic of the human, if we understand it as some kind of mental or spiritual space that might be translated in digital form, Right, um, you know, you, you really do, I think for this idea to work, you really need a kind of informational conception of the mind, right? Which then can be translated from the carbon substrate that we normally find our minds in, right? Into some kind of silicon deal, right? Which in turn can kind of go on indefinitely and evolve on its own accord and merge with other such things. And, you know, you get, you get the singularity then, right? And hence your university. Uh, and, and, and so, so th that's the, the, the kind of the, the panoply of transhumanism. And what they all have in common is this idea of trying to um, increase the difference, right, between the human and the human's animal origins, right? So it is really trying to transcendentalize the human in that sense, hence the trans. How, what have you run into in terms of people's response or thoughts around these things when you have this very contradictory idea here, which is, moving away from the things that make us uh like animals and and in turn making us more human while at the same time realizing that that kind of means becoming more like maybe cold and logical moving to different kinds of mediums uh that we live on and losing the things that people identify as human like there's this really it seems like there's this really deep tension between the biological messiness that we love about ourselves, but the, oh, that's also where like the rage and the anger and the and the genocide. Not everybody's and... loved it. Okay, yeah. I, I mean, I, I, no, no, I do think this is a very important point because if you look at, let's say, you go to the classical world, you know, so for example, all right, if, because we can also talk about the uh, theological space of this because I do think uh, what we are talking about here with transhumanism is a kind of materialistic version of spiritualism, but, but that, you know, you want to postpone that for a moment. But um, if you go back to the, uh, the ancient world, so the pagan world, right, the pre-theological world, and you look at who are the kind of people who are talking about humanity, right, before we get the Bible into it, right, they're the Stoics, okay? The Stoics are really the ones who talk about the idea of universal humanity, and indeed, when, when the Christian message starts to take off in the uh, first century AD, the people they try to hook onto are the Stoics among the pagans, okay? Now, what are the Stoics about, okay? Uh, the, the, they're not touchy-feely guys, okay? Uh, the Stoics, right, are the opposite, right, in many respects, right? They're people who, as it were, um, put up with pain, put up with suffering, right? And, and if you look at the kind of people who were Stoics, they tended to be in the military and politics. They often had violent ends, right? They were people who, in a sense, were very much into extension, extension of, the, uh, of, of themselves, you know, into the larger world, into the cosmos. They're the ones who invented the idea of cosmopolitan vision, right? That in some sense, we're not a citizen of Earth, but we're a citizen of the cosmos, right? I mean, they're the ones who came up with it. They're, in, in a sense, they're kind of like, they're like the prototype for Star Trek, right? I mean, uh, no, yeah. seriously, I mean, I, I do think, that, right now, who are these people, right? These are not touchy-feely people. These are not people tied to the Earth. Right? These are people who are, in a sense, are semi-detached to begin with. Okay? And, and it seems to me that the concept of humanity, 
has always had this kind of character to it. And that's one of the reasons why humanity has been tied so strongly to education. What is education? Education is about disciplining the body, disciplining the passions, right? And this is what rationality in effect amounts to, right? It amounts to a kind of channeling, right? A kind of, you know, in a way, getting your internal house in order, right? Um, and that is what stoicism is about. And of course, you know, you know, I, I'm not quite sure where you are, but if you're in Silicon Valley, you know that the most the most popular philosopher in Silicon Valley is this guy, Ryan Holiday. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of him. He writes all these books on stoicism. Oh, check him out. Check him out. Ryan Holiday. I mean, I love that um, analogy or that connection because you know, I, I, for the longest time, I considered myself a transhumanist and I had to really defend, I mean, I still think I kind of do to some extent, but it's, it's become more messy, but, um, I had to defend it and people would always say, why, what do you think about, you know, having like no emotion or being and being so cold and all of these things. And I would point to like Buddhist and I would say, you know, we look at people who are Buddhist and who meditate and, and are at peace with the way things go. They're not forcing, they're not resisting. They're not letting their emotions control them. And like, we might look at that and say that they live this very uh, most serene, enlightened, joyous life, but they lack all of those, you know, chaotic emotions uh, that we typically think we're going to lose if we transition to something like a, a machine or some kind of cyborg transhuman uh, entity. Yeah, but see, the problem I know, and I know there are a lot of transhumanists who are very attracted to Buddhism, but I think the big problem with Buddhism is... Um, Buddhism doesn't have enough of a sense of strife and enough of a sense of tension, right? It doesn't have enough of a sense of um, a purpose um, that, that, that I think is really, I mean, look, here's the thing, right? You don't need technology to be a Buddhist. I mean, right, you can avoid Silicon Valley altogether and be a Buddhist. In fact, most Buddhists manage to do that perfectly well. And so when somebody tells me, right, they're a transhumanist and a Buddhist, I say, why you waste your time with the technology? You can go to Buddhism directly. Right, because Buddhism, you know, is see, this is where Stoicism makes a difference, because Stoicism is actually about the idea that in some world, in some way, you are always in conflict with the world, and what that means in the first instance is you're in conflict with your body. Okay, and that's why transhumanism is so much about changing the body, right? Whatever else, all these different kinds of transhumanisms have in common, it's a general dissatisfaction with the platform in which we normally find ourselves. Yeah. Right. And, 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 and that is where you get that's where you get this kind of uh, this very dynamic kind of spiritualism, I would say. So so you may know um, back uh, 25 years ago, maybe now uh, there was the, this journalist, uh, Eric Davis, wrote this book called Technosis. I love it. It's somewhere behind me. OK, well, the gnosis part is what I want to draw your attention to here. Right. Um, and, and, and so Gnosticism right, as a kind of heresy, right, within Christianity and also in Islam, uh, actually in Judaism too, it's, a, it's an Abrahamic heresy basically, right, is about the idea that the body itself is corrupt, right, and that spirituality comes from liberating oneself from the body, and, and the body is understood in a very broad way, right, in the sense that the entire earthly existence is corrupt, right? The church is corrupt, tradition's corrupt, everything's corrupt. We've got to start all over again, right? We need, the re we need to reboot. Um, and, and that was always the Gnostic promise, you might say, and it's what made it always so dangerous within this context of established religion in, in, in the West. Um, but it is also the kind of thing, when you look at the, um, the religious origins of revolutionary activity in the early modern era, so the English Civil War, for example, is a good, a good example, people go back to a kind of Gnostic reading of the Bible, right, where, where, where the Jewish people are presented as these revolutionaries, right? They're bursting out of Egypt, they're bursting out of Rome, they're bursting out of everything, and they're going to burst out of the church and everything else. And it seems to me that transhumanism does have this kind of dimension to it, only now, as it were, the battering ram is science, right? We're going to science our way out of this, right? But it's the same thing, right? It's a kind of contempt, um, you know, for the body, right? Or, or, you know, at best seeing the body as a pure instrument, right? Something you can shave, you know, in other words, it's not seen as defining. And see, it's in this respect, even though transhumanism uh, in a way presents itself as a very scientific 
movement and very sensitive to changes that are going on in the scientific culture. Nevertheless, I think its fundamental metaphysical worldview is really at odds with Darwin's theory of evolution because Darwin's theory of evolution says, in the end, you're dead, end of story. You yeah. get extinct, man, right? It's just a matter of time, right? That's the bottom line of Darwin, okay? Transhumanists deny this. They believe that it's always possible to kind of carry on in some form or another. Yeah, what do you think about? Um, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, Chardin and the Omega Point. Because I mean, yeah, Teilhard de Chardin. Sure, I was Chardin, taught this yeah. stuff when I was a teenager because I was uh, trained originally by the Jesuits. And you know, oh, Teilhard wow. de Chardin was a, a renegade Jesuit, right? And the, and the, and the Catholic Church put all of his books on the index until he was dead. And so it was only in the 1960s, actually, uh, that uh, Teilhard's works were actually generally available. Uh, and and I, I I personally think there is something to that. Uh, though he is, um, I mean, he's heretical at many different levels because um, one of the things that he claims, which in a way ma makes him a little bit difficult to reconcile to a purely spiritual standpoint, uh, is that he is kind of a materialist in the sense that he believes that in some sense, we as kind of the, the leading force of the earth evolve into God in a material way, right? So, so Teilhard de Chardin took seriously ideas of eugenics and things, for example, and he took, you know, this idea of the human stewardship, right, of the cosmos, basically, in a very materialistic way. Um, and, and so, you know, one might read him and say, well, is there any transcendent sense of God at all in, in him? Or is God something the thing that we're just evolving into, right? God is, as it were, just the name of the endpoint, hence the omega. Right. right? Um, and, and, and I think that kind of, in a way, always makes him a bit disturbing, even for people who aren't particularly wedded, you know, to Roman Catholic theology or whatever, but, but nevertheless believe in some idea of a transcendent God. Um, Teilhard is actually quite materialistic by that standpoint. Interesting. Yeah. I alluded to him specifically because of the, the metaphysical component that he does bring into it. And you do see a lot of like Christian transhumanist, um, ironically, like there, I, I think there is like, pretty significant uh, movement sure. of Christian transhumanists, which seems yes. like a very, it does feel a bit contradictory, but uh, to your, I guess, to your point, there is some uh, metaphysical aspect that is kind yeah, of baked yeah. into it. You know, where, where, where I would turn to, to, you know, in terms of where I think you, you really see where transhumanism and Christianity work really well together is Mormonism. <laughs> okay. Because the Mormons, okay. And this is what made the Mormons so heretical as a kind of breakaway sect from, uh, from, from Christianity in the 19th century, right, was that the Mormons are thorough, thoroughly materialist, right? I mean, the Mormons believe that the dead are gonna be resurrected, right? They're gonna come back in full body form better than ever, right? I mean, I mean the, 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 the Mormons literally, literally believe in the idea of a heaven on earth. Mm -hmm. It is a metaphor for them, it's literal. And that's what made them such problematic people within Christianity. And, and, and of course it accounts for why Mormonism has been very active in civil life, right? It does, in a sense, even though they have these religious practices that's never prevented them from being in the middle of what's going on in society. In fact, they've been actually much more thoroughly integrated than even the Catholic church has, even though the Catholic church is the largest Christian denomination in the United States, okay? So the Mormons are very materialistic um, but they do believe that there is a kind of salvation in matter, right? Um, and, and that the resurrection is literal. And you see that, that's transhumanism, right? That's the kind of thinking that'll get you to cryonics and stuff like that pretty easily. And that's why the Mormon church has been one of the biggest uh, private funders of biomedical research in the United States, Brigham Young University, right? Wow. In, in Salt Lake City, Utah, right? So, so, I mean, Mormonism, I think, is kind of where you would want to look to see most clearly, right, this kind of um, overlap between Christianity and transhumanism. And so is this struggle, I guess, between uh, maybe spirituality and materialism, is that what you refer to when you're talking about the bipolar kind of disorder that we struggle with as we navigate this transformation? Or is that more about like the liberal egalitarian worldview against the kind of like go as far as you can as an individual worldview it's 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 more like the latter I, this is what i would say i think um given the checkered history 
of what has been done in the name of humanity, right? Uh, because most of the atrocities have been done in the name of humanity. Oh, yeah. uh, and and, and um, I think where we are, the bipolar stuff comes from the fact that people, especially younger people, people who aren't already invested you know, in some kind of institutionalized form of the human condition, but are basically open-minded about where they can go, um, are basically on the fence with regard to just how valuable human is. And, and, and if, it's, it, if it is valuable, what is the basis for the value, right? I think that's kind of where the bipolar comes from because there are gonna be some people, right? And these are like the, the radical environmentalists who are gonna say, you know, in a sense, this human stuff is species chauvinism basically, and it's leading, gonna lead to disaster, okay? And that we've got to pull back and we can't so strongly identify with the human, especially given in the history of humanity, what has passed for human, you know, has been, you know, white males, blah, blah, right? That stuff, right? So that's one part of the bipolar. And of course, the other part of the bipolar is saying we're too restrained, right? We need to go further, right? Look at how much we've been able to do, you know, in the history of science and technology over the past 200 years, right? We've doubled life expectancy. We have populated the planet multifold, right? I mean, we've done all of this stuff. Carry on, guys. And, 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 if we, and if we trash the planet, there's always Mars, right? <laughs> and this is, you know, the Elon Musk kind of, sure. you, you, you know, I mean, hey, big horizons out there. Um, and you see, it seems to me that, that, that people are drawn, you know, these things are pulling in opposite directions, clearly, right? And this is why I talk about the difference between upwingers and downwingers, right? The downwingers are the people who literally believe that the humans belong on earth. And in a sense, it's either, we either survive here or not at all, right? The downwingers. And the upwingers are the people who are much more open-minded and say, yeah, we might trash the planet, but we've got Mars. We've, you know, we can upload here and there and everywhere. We can have multiple copies of, of ourselves in Alpha Centauri. So somebody can find us a couple of billion years from now and start civilization all over again, right? I mean, I mean you, so you've got both of these things operating simultaneously, but what they both have in common right, is a skepticism about the st stability of the 1.0 human, right? They basically believe we've got to move in some direction, either up or down, but we've got to move. We can't just stay the way they, we are. And that explains why young people, especially, are not attracted at all to the conventional left-right distinction in ideology, right? Where that stuff just doesn't make any sense to these people, right? I mean, you know, um, up-down actually makes more sense and you can kind of plot people more clearly on the up down continuum than you can on the left right continuum among younger people, especially. Oh, people my age, it's a different matter, of course. We still vote and believe in politics in the conventional sense and all that jazz, right? But if you're talking about the younger people, it's a different story altogether. So, I mean, when you say that, that is alluding to the fact that there is definitely a major tension between, you know, two halves of the species. What are the implications on uh, morality, uh, <laughs> politics, uh, our social uh, uh, contracts? You know, um, what what does this mean for us as we move forward? Well, that's a good story. Uh, good, good question. I mean, um, I have to say, uh, one of the few people who I think has really thought about this in a kind of joined up way is Pope Francis. God bless him. I mean, you know, not that he would, you know, and he's not a transhumanist. Let me just start by saying, uh, even though he is a Jesuit, uh, he is not a transhumanist. But but he put out a, an encyclical, papal encyclical, a few years ago called Laudato Si. Um, and what it's about, it's a kind of social justice agenda. But the thing that was really striking, right, was that he brought together in a very artful way, um, the you know the traditional Catholic concern for um, you know justice for the poor, okay, um, with environmentalism. Right, so environmental justice and social justice going together, and and that and 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 he even you know was able to show right that 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 in a sense that the, um, the exploitation of nature and the extinction of species right was in a way a kind of um, a kind of outward uh, reflection of the way in fact we treat humans, um, and you know maybe not directly but indirectly, and it's part of the same picture basically a kind of general disregard. Uh, for the resources of the planet, right? That we think we can just push people around, push animals around, push everything around, right? And just kind of shape them whatever way we want. And if a few of them die, we just, you know, don't lose sleep over it, 
Um, and, and so basically, um, Pope Francis here is, is a kind of calling, moral call to arms, right? A kind of moral call to arms where, where it basically he would, if he had his way, I think, would bring together all the downwingers, right? So all the down, the environmental justice people, right? The social justice people, right? All of these people who in a sense have been historically disenfranchised by the elites, because at the end of the day, transhumanism is kind of elites on steroids for the first, in the first instance, right? The kind of people who are really leading transhumanism, right, are the people with the hyper-education, hyper-imagination, hyper-money, right? I mean, they, they, that's, the, you know, regardless of all the talk about universal basic income and all that bullshit, right? The, the bottom line is this is a very elite-driven movement. You cannot deny that about transhumanism. And so then the question becomes, okay, it's an elite movement. All the smart guys are transhumanists, blah, blah. Okay, what's going to happen then to the other 98% of the population, right? And, and you know, 98% of the species. You see, and, and so Pope Francis has, has got a, he's got a, he's, he's figured out the market, right? I mean, in a way, he's kind of figured out the market for the Catholic Church of the 21st century, because um, I think this uh, idea of bringing together environmental justice and social justice is a real political winner, okay? It's a real political winner. Uh, and, and I don't think there's anything comparable to that sort of joined up normative thinking in transhumanism. I don't think anything close to that exists. Yeah, you you alluded to something there that I think uh, is something you talk about in your book. I think it's right in the beginning, which is that um, in Norman Garris kind of way, we uh, we regard each other with a form of like benign neglect, I think you said. Yes, and, that's right. That's right. Yes. Yeah. And so what that makes me think, though, is as we kind of start this transition, while it is a an elite driven um agenda or you know spearhead it does definitely ripple down as we've seen with you know the masses now having social media and whatnot and i can't help but wonder is that benign neglect being baked into the algorithms that are kind of acting as the fil filters for how we communicate and is that maybe you know is is the i guess the downwingers as you call them is there a chance that maybe they are just kind of encapsulating themselves within their own bias or being programmed into that same kind of benign neglect? Yeah, I think this is a tough one because obviously social media is something that both sides are partaking in. It's not, I mean, I think it would really be a mistake to think of, um, of the downwingers as somehow, um, I mean, they may be technophobic ideologically, but they all use social media. How do you suppose, you know, Greta Thunberg gets all her nonsense going, right? It's, everybody's just smartphoning each other, right, in that movement, right? And they can all, and all these eco, eco warriors can just gather on short notice and start trouble with every G7, G20 conference that takes place, right? How does that happen? That happens through social media, right? What, what social media doesn't give these people is anything of a kind of um, institutional infrastructure on which to build. So in fact, what they come across as, and uh, you know, and this is, I think, this is the way they come across in, in, in the public mind, is these people come across as periodic nuisances, right? Uh, you know, they they kind of cause a little bit of disturbance, you know, so they all mobilize and then they dissipate again, and then they mobilize and then they dissipate again, and that's kind of what happens, right? Um, and 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 that's I, I think um, the pro, you know, and and here I think, right uh, with. with this is not this is not because of um, of their reluctance to embrace the technology. It's just the technology can only give you so much, right? So 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 in a sense, um, I don't know if you're familiar. You must be familiar with uh, Yevgeny Moritsov. He is oh. a, a tech critic, right? Yeah. And yeah. so he published a book um, published a book a few years ago uh, to save the world, right? Uh, click this or something, right? It, and it's a critique of what he calls solutionism which he believed was kind of a particular Silicon Valley disease, but I think it's a disease that a lot of us have as a result of using all of these, you know, smartphones and all these modern IT, um, is that people believe if, the, you know, all you need is an app, right? And, you know, the right app will save the world, right? So you need an app for figuring out how you can vote every 30 minutes on something and then we'll have democracy, right? I mean, there are clowns in Silicon Valley who believe shit like this, right? Um, so in other words, they really want to, they have no institutional imagination, right? What they have is they know how to design apps. And, and you see, um, while there is a tendency to portray 
all of these uh, people who are able to design apps and all the rest of it uh, as somehow sinister forces that are controlling our minds with algorithms and so forth. No, they're much more simple-minded than that, actually, right? And what they're doing is they're fragmenting our consciousness, um, you know, app by app, as it were. Um, well, and I guess actually, if I can real quick, I think that's my point, though, is that the the people who are creating the technology who might be considered the elite are creating the tools that we all use. It's not that we're technophobic. It's just that we are, our consciousness now is living in this digital space that they've created that is built into this way that's fragmented and kind of, um, you know, yeah, they didn't know what they did. Yeah. I mean, I mean, God, whenever you see Mark Zuckerberg go, go before any kind of congressional panel or parliament, he's like a deer in headlights, this guy. Yeah. He doesn't really know what he's come up with. He's like, he has to wait for the senators to tell him what he's done, right? Uh, and, and that he needs 12 lawyers to uh, advise him as to what to say so he doesn't get himself locked up in prison. I mean, that's the level of, 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 of lack of self-knowledge that these people have. It's, it, it, it's, it's, I tell you, it's a scandal, to be honest, but we're stuck with it. <laughs> yeah. I was just talking to Katie Cook, um, who wrote a book called The Psychology of Silicon Valley. And she was talking about how the one of the big issues she she sees in the tech industry is that there's no like you we don't have people who study the humanities there's not a lot of people who are in the humanities who are in the this rooms making decisions so it loses that like social scientist policy yeah. lens uh from all of the tech development and it's 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 amazing how pervasive that is you really do you know because you know because there are so many different of these tech geniuses floating around in Silicon Valley, there's so many of these different companies and so forth. And they're quite uniformly like this, yeah. right? They, they have this kind of blinders. Um, and, the, and the problem is, of course, th th they've dragged the rest of us into, into their limited imagination. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and to that extent, I mean, you know, one of the promises of technology, you know, like the Douglas Rushkoffs and, and, and the, mm -hmm. the early 90s types is that technology and this transhumanism was going to be really liberating. It was going to be kind of psychedelic yeah. and freeing. We were going to have access to all these different mind states and um, experiences, virtual reality, et cetera. But it seems concerningly like we are actually just programming ourselves into more bias, like rather than transcending, right? It feels like we are programming our biases, making echo chambers, you know, closing yes. in. I would love to hear yes. your thoughts on kind of like okay, that well, first transcendence. Of all, first of all, that is true. Uh, and I think it's true across the board. And I, and I think that point is worth pointing out because I do think one of the more pernicious tendencies that one notices when one, because a lot of people realize what you're talking about, but there's a certain way of looking at it, which I think only adds more fuel to the fire. Um, and that's the thing. Only some people are stuck in echo chambers, but not me. Right. right. I mean, and, and this is the view that you get from the so-called smart people, right? The guys who do, you know, brain science and evolutionary psychology. And they say, oh, my God, you know, if you look at these people who are, you know, on the Internet, you know, 24 hours a day, their minds get warped in this way. And they're just focusing on certain things as if the clown doing the research is in exactly the same way. 100 percent. OK. Right, and, and, and that I think is incredibly pernicious, right? The, the tendency for this kind of analysis, which I think is correct, to not be applied across the board, right? In other words, it tends to be applied in a very selective way, right? So if you go to anyone, right, uh, especially if you go to the smart people, right, and you say, well, you know, there's all this bias and echo chambers, filter bubbles, things like, yeah, it's a shame, it's, it's a tragedy. I mean, you know, I mean, I don't even know why we give these people the right to vote, right? I mean, I, I know a lot of the ways in which conservatives and populists get demonized this way has a lot of this character to it, right? Because these guys are, th are thriving in these echo chambers, f filter bubbles. But the point is it applies across the board. It applies to the so-called smart people too. So, so yeah. oh, please go on. No, no, I was going to say I have a kind of a kind of solution, but uh, um, and I it's, love not, I mean, it's not OK. It's not exactly a solution, but in a sense, it is a kind of proposal that actually comes from the period that you were alluding to before, you know, the Douglas Rushkoff early 2000s. Right. You know, uh, the, the summer of love for the Internet um, uh, is, is, is if you recall, there was, a, you know, you know, Mackenzie Wark. Um, Mackenzie Wark uh, wrote the ha a Hacker's Manifesto, um, 2004, I think. Um, 
and he he hit something and, and, and you know considering 2004 that's pretty good how long ago that was um he he hit upon something which i do think is going to be kind of more the trend uh and and that is um see one of the ways in which I mean, what, what are the consequences of moving from a kind of top-down mainframe based computer approach right to the of the internet to this more social media distributed approach is that more and more people now actually have the skills to get involved right have to be uh, you know knowledge producers and you know and and this is why this is why fake news and all this you know why we have filter bubbles right is because more and more people now are able to take control of the means of knowledge production right they're able to do the editing they're able to upload their youtube videos right they're able to do all they can deep fake right deep fake got to love it right i mean you know more and more people can do this right and 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 that serves a kind of egalitarian function in a way um and very often and this is where the hackers come in right because the, the thing about hackers is kind of interesting right is they can come from anywhere and they can strike anyone right um some some so some you know some clown you know 16 year old you know, who, who is in his bedroom can end up breaking into the Pentagon. I mean, my God, what's going on there, right? But that's, that, that's the new look of democracy, okay? Because in a sense, what that does is it kind of, it levels uh, the, the power hierarchies, at least temporarily. Uh, and, and this is why I think, um, you know, uh, military uh, thinking around the world is now uh, pushing much more strongly in the direction of cybersecurity right, as being the, the kind of cutting edge of where warfare is going to be in our time. Um, and that kind of warfare is in a way a product of the breaking down of the hierarchies that this kind of democratization of skills that people have who are on social media all the time. So, so it's, an inter it's, it's a much more dynamic thing that's going on. So this idea about the filter bubbles and the echo chambers and all this, yes, I think there's a sense in which if you're just doing a snapshot of what's happening now, yes, those things are definitely there. But if you look at the long-term prognosis, right, I see the space becoming much more dynamic. And I think, the, you know, I think a much more serious issue is going to be uh, the kind of post-truth thing, which I've also written a lot about, right? Namely, what are the standards of what we consider to be true and false? I think that's a much more serious problem, uh, you know, that, that we're not going to resolve very easily in a world where so many people have the capacity to produce knowledge that's then made available to so many other people. And so that you're perfectly going to where, right where I was thinking, which is if that is the case, if we have this ubiquitous kind of access to really propagandize in a way um yeah. and and we have this world of illusion or appearance i think as you call it uh, ca uh casting out the world of reality don't we run into a really serious issue when reality comes forcefully back at us and says hey you've been playing with appearance and illusion this whole time but there's a hard truth that you now need to own up to maybe um i don't think it's so straightforward actually uh no no um because remember, Elon Musk has those rockets ready to, to blast off into space once reality gets too heavy for him. For right? 10 I mean, people. <laughs> well, it's 10 people, admittedly. You know, yeah. and you can imagine like William Shatner being strapped right in the back. Yeah. Uh, but, but, but the thing is, that, 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 but that is kind of the issue in a way, because um, even, if we're, you know, even if we're not talking about the very explicit attempts to disinform, right, which of course do exist, um, Nevertheless, there is, even without that, there is quite a big gap between what people think is within the bounds of reality, okay? I mean, and, and our, my, my dear transhumanist friends are not, you know, exactly making life easy on this point because transhumanists have very far out notions about what's realistic, yeah. right? Remember, isn't it what, 2030, 2040? I forget what Uncle Ray keeps on pushing the date up a little bit about when we're able to, you know, upload our minds and all the rest of it. You know, I mean, I mean, the point is people do believe that stuff and, and, and that includes the smart people. Uh, and, and so, you know, what actually counts as a threshold of reality, right, that we can be orienting our long-term actions toward, right? That is, I mean, I, I can't think of a time in my life when it's been so contested, right? Yeah. Even if you think about the Cold War, right? So I grew up during the Cold War. And from, from by the standards of where we are today, the Cold War was straightforward, 
right? Because basically the issue was mutually assured destruction, right? It was basically, you know, what's how the world, how is the world going to end? It'll be nuclear war. And so what do you do? Make sure it doesn't happen. And everybody was on the same page with this, regardless of, of uh, whatever the ideological persuasions were. OK, right. we don't have anything like that kind of consensus today, not even on climate change, which you would think would be something comparable. Yeah, we need some kind of looming threat to unify us, maybe. <laughs> well, some or looming threat everybody could see as looming. I mean, a problem, uh, I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm, my mind boggles with the climate change issue because you would have thought climate change could 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 do this. But you or see the, or the pandemic. I mean, either one or the pandemic. Sure. But I have a feeling, I mean, you know. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I have to say in the middle of last year when the pandemic was at its peak, I, I sort of had these optimistic view that maybe, yes, that would focus minds. Um, but one of the things that I found um, somewhat disappointing was, in fact, most of the uh, strategies that the governments adopted were, were purely mitigating strategies. In other words, they were acting as if um, world will carry on eventually as it did before once this thing is over, whenever it's over. Uh, whereas I would have thought you know, this would have been this pandemic, which basically shut down the world's economy for a few months, would have been a great time, for example, to go green in a big way, mm -hmm. right? To get, you know, China in particular, which does have the power to do something. I was extremely disappointed uh, with the Chinese Communist Party meeting in um, 2020, May, May of 2020, right? Which was really kind of at the peak of the pandemic and where they were talking seriously in China about making this sort of green transition. And I sort of thought, shit, you know, if China wants to take over the world economically, right? And they're looking at it from the long term. This is the time to get a jump start on green mm -hmm. and to go, you know, and, 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 and then everyone else would be forced to go down that route. But they didn't do it. They, they, they basically choked. Um, and and uh, so even though they do do a lot of, um, you know, electric cars and all that kind of stuff, nevertheless, they haven't done anything with regard to their carbon emissions uh, in any kind of serious way. Um, so there isn't a sufficient focus of minds here. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I would say, let me offer this hypothesis as to why there isn't a focus, uh, the, the minds aren't focused. See, the thing about the nuclear war back in the Cold War days is um, it was in a sense a manufactured threat. We manufactured the threat for ourselves. And, and people were convinced of that, right? So, so the, whole, the whole discourse surrounding mutually assured destruction was really about human psychology and you know who's going to push the button first and what are we going to do right it was all very much within this human crafted sphere right uh and and we're basically it was all about people second guessing each other um now, now that got pretty treacherous sometimes right but in a sense people were able to believe that because in a sense they kind of understood they all agreed Right, you know, we made up this game. Now let's play it. Well, yeah. We're, whereas with the climate change thing, right? As long as you don't get, as long as you don't have everybody on board with the idea that climate change is is anthropogenic, right? Because that I think would be the crucial point. Because minds would be focused if people actually, you know, because it's one thing to say, okay, the you know temperatures going up or whatever, climate is changing. But until you get people to own up to the fact that humans are, in fact, the primary cause of what these problems are we're seeing, um, unless you get that sorted, you're not going to get anything like the kind of consensus that you had during the Cold War. Are we are we victims of the, I guess, first world or Western world's success in the human 1.0 experiment in that regard and that maybe we have too much comfort and pleasure and distractions, you know, we'll, like in the sense where we'll use augmented and virtual reality to you know, I think you've talked about it before, but like, you know, we'll, we'll get rid of homeless people from our vision with augmented reality and we'll jump into a virtual reality in our little, like, you know, squalor uh, boxes and, and, but live in these very colorful worlds. And we're kind of just going to let the world burn around us while we uh, sip on the cocaine water as it were, as, uh, as the rats. Well, I mean, <laughs> isn't it already happening? Exactly. But I mean, are we, are we, are we in a real struggle here to actually, break over to that next step because of these things. Yes, I, I, I do think that does, that adds even more difficulty. Yes, because, um, and, and this, this raises again, a, a very uh, important um, existential question for humans about where do they get meaning in their life from? Um, because look, the fact that so many people are spending all this time in front of their screens and and you know nobody's forcing them to. They they like doing it, 
right? And they're, and they're quite willing to give up their data and everything for it, you know? I mean, you know, um, you know, privacy activists these days have a real struggle because their biggest enemy are the people giving away their data all the time because they want to download more video games or something. Um, and, and so it seems to me that, you know, if you think about what people, the, the sorts of things that people find meaningful in life as kind of what they do, how they spend their time, right? Mm -hmm. You know, don't ask, don't give them a survey and ask them, because, you know, if you give them a survey, they're going to trot out the usual bullshit. I believe in God and I believe, you know, in the next generation. And, you know, we have to think about future generations and the environment and blah, blah, blah. No, no, look at what they actually do. OK, uh, and if you look at what people actually do, right, they're spending most of their time in front of screens, very often in kind of virtual spaces, right, where even if they're interacting with people who on the other end are real, often it's through avatars. OK, so so there's mediation there. Right, even when they're in doing something that looks a bit like human interaction, um, and and so you you got to conclude that um, that's kind of what people find meaning in their lives, and so the whole idea of the world coming to an end, you know, through climate catastrophe or something like that, you know, as long as these people are asleep when it happens, um, they're probably not going to worry too much. I mean, I I I, I know this sounds perhaps a little bit glib, but 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 it does seem to me. That that at some point you have to judge people by what they do, right? How they lead, how they live their lives, not kind of the statements they pontificate about, but how do they actually live their lives? And I think that is the biggest problem we have in dealing with um, these crises, right? These uh, the, these climate crises in particular, maybe even the pandemic and so forth, um, is that is that actually people do not behave in a way that really takes this stuff seriously. It's not yeah. that, you know, if you ask them, they'll say it, take it seriously, but they don't really, they don't is really. That, is that because the real world can't compete in terms of like novelty and meaning really with something yes, that is exactly generated? No, no, this is where Silicon Valley has succeeded beyond its wildest expectations. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, no, it's true. Right. And that's why they make so much money. And that's why they are running the world's economy and all the rest of it is because they are very successful in having shifted people's existential horizons, you know, to the cyberspace. It didn't have to happen, but it did happen. Yeah, I, I write sci-fi and I wrote a short story at one point about a, a kid who was basically like talking about how it was It's kind of like the world's critiquing him for being addicted to video games, but his real thing was to say, hey, in the video games, I run this big group of people and we take on like these big challenges together and it's really meaningful. And then when I go out into the real world, I get treated like shit at a job I hate with no sense of meaning or purpose or value to my community. And it's like, you know, when you have those two comparisons, it's very easy to want to live in the virtual world where it feels meaningful. Exactly. I mean, I think the way to think about what, what you've just described uh, is a kind of high tech version of what religion uh, did mm. when, when people, uh, you know, especially when people, because one of the things that, that, that has been very interesting, especially with regard to the, um, to the Abrahamic religions, which are very narrative driven religions, right? Um, is that people inhabit these narratives from the Bible, from the Quran, whatever, um, and they become these people, right? They, they, they become versions of these people uh, and, and they see their whole lives in this manner, even though it, it may end up causing them to do all kinds of strange and even self-destructive things. Um, nevertheless, that is where they get the meaning from their lives. So mm. I see uh, all these people who spend their time on video games, um, you know, because this was also kind of the, the solace of religion uh, in, in the Abrahamic tradition was that very often the people who had this kind of deep, deep faith in God uh, actually did live in, in, a, in a material world that was less than glorious. And very often these were people in captivity even. Huh. Um, and, and so they were able to uh, escape as it were into these narratives which were very powerful and which they could inhabit, they could become someone in them. Right. Um, I mean, so, for example, um, you know, we could we, you know, I, I'm sure there must be some cultural studies person who's worked on this. You know, if you compare the, uh, the, the the kind of avatars that you get in a very violent kind of video games where the where the, you know, the, 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 the per person playing the video game inhabits and becomes this character who goes around killing everybody. Right. What's the difference between that and let's say a terrorist? right? A kind of like an Islamic terrorist or something like that from the standpoint of how the mind works under those situations. I mean, both of them are in a sense seeing the concrete reality in terms of a kind of virtual reality, sure. right? Uh, and, 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 and so in that respect, 
um, what we are seeing now, as you've described it, um, I don't think it's, I mean, I think it, you know, in a way, obviously it's quite dangerous, you might say, uh, at a global level, but, but it is familiar. I mean, it isn't, it isn't uh, I mean, unless you think that religion is pathological, yeah. um, I don't think it's particularly pathological. I think this is a kind of strong aspect of the human condition that has now become sublimated through this uh, technology. Yeah, as, as you were saying, that makes me think, unless you really have the skin bag bias or you're super attached to, to staying human or everything human, there isn't really anything that's necessarily bad about letting the evolutionary trajectory carry you into the virtual world if it provides the, the things that you seek, so long yeah. as maybe you don't uh, fail the world that sustains that, which is the climate world, maybe the, the ecosystem, um, you know. The, the, the world that you're, you still have to occupy until we make the great transition into digital space. Well, I'll space. tell you, okay, see, that, that now you, you've put your finger on something here that, that I think is where the uh, transhumanists and all these other people should be focusing their ecological attention, is man, oh man, all of these supercomputers that are going to be used to upload our consciousness and all that, they take up a lot of energy. <laughs> they got to be somewhere. What a nightmare. Right. All these projects, cryo, you know, the only thing, you know, cryonics, which is basically air conditioned cemeteries, right? Cryonics, the one thing that has going for it is not enough people are doing it. But if cryonics ever became popular and you think about all the air conditioning that would be necessary to keep, I mean, you would, you, you'd blow the fuses of the planet. I mean, I mean, you know, so, so, so this is, this is where transhumanism lacks joined up thinking, because if you look at all of so the issue with supercomputers and cryonics and all that, the issue isn't so much that it won't happen. In some sense, I kind of believe it will happen, right? The problem is that the energy cost, right, you know, is going to be enormous, you know. Now, maybe we'll, maybe we'll make um, quantum computing scalable so that we can cut energy costs that way. Some people speculate about that, but we're far away from doing that. Solar um, tech. Yeah, solar tech. I mean, there are all kinds of, you know, possibilities out there. Um, but the point is, uh, transhumanism requires a kind of joined up thinking to actually get its more extravagant projects hooked up with a sustainable, ecologically sustainable world. Yep. Steve, I feel like I could keep talking about this forever, man, but I know we're coming up on time. Uh, okay. Before, before we jump out of here, though, I do want to give you a chance. Is there anything you're working on right now? Anything you want to point people to? I mean, you got a ton of great books that I would highly recommend, but I would love to just give you the floor to kind of point okay, people well, in any well, direction. Okay, I, I, uh, I suppose the, the most recent book of mine that is directly related to the trans-post-human thing is, is called Nietzschean Meditations. Um which came out, I don't know if you've seen that. Uh, I haven't actually. Okay, I'll send it to you afterwards. Uh, it came out a couple of years ago now and it's called uh, Untimely, the, the subtitle is Untimely Thoughts at the Dawn of the Transhuman Era. And it talks about, I mean, the, the main things it talks about is um, this issue of morphological freedom in transhumanism, which we, we, we touched on earlier, which I think is a very powerful idea actually. Um, and then the other issue, which we didn't talk so much about um, which I also think is, is if it is possible to, in some sense, live forever, let's say in your biological body, which is one transhumanist goal, should you, right? So in other words, um, it seems to me death gets put on the table in a, in a new way, uh, because I think so far transhumanists have taken for granted that if uh, you're given the opportunity to live forever, you would, right? But I look at it a different way. I say, okay, let's say you can live forever. Then this ends up making death a kind of decision in a much more straightforward way. So in other words, issues of suicide, which have been traditionally taboo, right? One of the reasons why suicide had been taboo is because there's a sense in which life is a gift. You only have it for a limited period of time. You know, you, you, you should just not like abandon it, right? And, and so there's all this moralism that's about anti-suicide, right? Which is tied to mortality right? Natural mortality. And so therefore suicide, you should not preempt it, right? This is kind of the way that certainly the Catholic church and people like that think about these things. Okay. But now you take that off the table, you take mortality off the table, then death looks different, right? Then you enter and the if, world of Camus, right? Where the only question man has to ask himself is whether or not to kill himself. Right. Well, exactly. Right. And, and why would you want to kill yourself? Well, one reason might be because you're interested in future generations, because one of the problems that transhumanism has, okay. I mean, let's put it this way. How many transhumanists do you know that have children? 
Okay, I mean, transhumanism is an incredibly, um, you know, it's basically, I mean, again, the constituency are for the people who are advocating it, uh, right? So in other words, they're going to be in the front of the queue, right? Once the life expectancy, you know, extension stuff is worked out, right? And they're going to be the first beneficiaries of it. I mean, you know about Aubrey de Grey, right? I mean, you always time the moment when immortality begins to just when you're still young enough that you could actually benefit from this, where you're not too dilapidated. So you usually gotta be like 70 or something, right? And so that then becomes the people who start contributing to his fund. Um, and, and it seems to me um, that there is a reason though why you would want future generations, right? Once you stop thinking so selfishly. Uh, and that is because uh, new generations typically, because they start off with a, a blank slate, as it were, right? They don't have the baggage of the past, right? Because this is the thing. If you live forever, right, you're going to remember all that shit, right? I mean, especially because all these people who are keen on living forever, right? They want to get rid of Alzheimer's, right? So they, they want perfect memories, right? They want to remember. They say, this is the world you want? You want people with perfect memories living hundreds and hundreds of years? How is anything new ever going to happen? Right, and this is where you know generational succession has been an incredibly important force, you know, for social and cultural change historically. Just you know, as a natural fact, right? You bring new people into the world; they don't have the baggage of the old people. They see the past differently than the people who had lived through it, and that can make all the difference in the world. And how is transhumanism going to assure this? Because otherwise, it is not clear where the innovation in the future is going to come from, and that's why you might have a moral obligation to kill yourself if you're a transhumanist, right? I mean, at least I entertain this kind of idea uh, and, and I look at how this might come about, um, but I think it's a serious issue, actually. I think it is a, quite a serious issue. Again, it's part of trying to make transhumanism more joined up, right? More joined up in what the implications are of all these things, assuming these things happen. So I'll send you a copy of the book. Um, but uh, yeah, that's my, my advertisement. <laughs> Please do. I mean, we'll link to the rest of it. Yeah, I want to. I love the ending of uh, that question. Is as a transhumanist, how do you reconcile the idea of killing yourself? That's a great place to stop, Steve. I want to just take a second to thank you, man. I really appreciate this conversation. It was fantastic. Well, great, and uh, you know, look forward to further contact in the future. Okay, and good luck. Likewise, thanks, man. <laughs>